there for you, ladies and gentlemen, for 2010, A Tape Odyssey, my compilation, my big mixtape this week, which features music suitable for a journey into space. And I am joined by one of the preeminent space rockers <laughs> of this or any other time, uh, Ed O'Brien from Radiohead. Hi. How are you doing, man? I'm very good, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm so excited to see you, to meet you. It's, I mean, we've met before, but yeah. it's always uh, very exciting to see you. I'm such a big fan of Radiohead. And actually, we haven't interviewed uh, too many other musicians on this program. Emmy the Great was our only other musical guest, I think, wasn't she? No, Supergrass, of course. Mm. But I'm a sort of... Uh, let's say, unusual interviewer at the best of times. <laughs> okay. And then when I'm up against people that I really admire, as I have been on this show, you know, it's uh, sometimes it gets away from me. I'm just yeah. warning you in case things get really okay. rubbish. All right, OK. But before we go any further, can I fire <coughs> off our quick fire questions sure. to you that I've been asking all my guests for the last few weeks? Uh, answer any way you wish to to these. Who are you? Uh, Edward O'Brien. What do you do? I play guitar and I'm a dad. Who do you do? Who do you do? How do you do? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Faves? Faves. Uh, football. <laughs> Worsties? Worsties, uh, smelly cabs. Jedward? X Factor? Thank you very much, Ed. Right. That's all there is to it. There's no right, right or wrong way to respond to those questions. Yeah, OK. Um, how are you doing anyway? How's the good. band? Really good. We're, um, we're in the studio at the moment. Well, not right this moment. We're in the heart of the record. Yeah. And um, it's great. It feels, it feels, I'm really excited. I feel like this is the best record. <laughs> I'm, I'm sounding like one of those blokes. I feel this is the best record we've ever made. But it really, it's genuinely exciting. It's very different from what we did last time. And, um, uh, yeah, it's just, a, it's, it's just, you know, it's just really nice to be doing this. It's so good to be making music with, 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 with the band that you feel is, is still as good as it's ever been. Yeah. Especially after the last record in Rainbows, you managed <coughs> to kind of completely reinvent yourselves and actually you seem to turn a corner and, and start having a lot more fun as well yeah that's what it looked like from the outside yeah. looking in was that fair <laughs> it wasn't fun making the record but what we decided was that really making records have been hard it's always been a slog traditionally radiohead in the studio has been it's kind of don your tin helmet get in there and just see it out it's kind of like a war of attrition yeah and basically at the end of in rainbows it had taken three years to sort of come together and we initially started off on our own and then we pulled in someone else and then we're off, you know, after a year we, went, we, we worked with Nigel again and... Nigel Godrich. Nigel says, Godrich, yeah. that's right. And it was such a hard, uh, it was such a slog. We knew we had these songs and we knew, we, we, we really believed in these songs. So we had to do it right and it just took a long time and, and we basically decided then and there at the end of that record, we are never going to do it again this way. And so everything that was kind of like the end of Radiohead Mark Two, and we decided that the only the only way that the, the the only way that will work for us to carry on is to actually do it in a different spirit. You know, enjoy it. This is after Hail to the Thief. No, this is after In Rainbows. Oh, this is after In Rainbows. Yeah, yeah, this is after In Rainbows. Oh, I see. So the touring, you know, so because that was such a hard record to make, right? And because um, it sounds so carefree. <laughs> well, that's what everyone says. It's like, yeah. You guys, it sounds like you had a great time in the studio. It's like, oh man. It sounds like a summer's day. That was a slog. Wow. I mean, it was really, really, it was a really long process. And by the end, for instance, a song like, I don't know, a song like uh, House of Cards had been recorded six times. Okay. Plus the fact we played them, we, we, our genius idea in, in uh, 2006 to go out on tour and do about 50 odd shows. And the idea was we play all these songs live, get back in the studio and record them. Right. And that's when we went in back in with Nigel. We went in and recorded them having played these songs 50 times. So we, we kind of got the arrangement sorted. We're like, we just want to get them down. We've played this enough. We're just, and we got them down and they were, most of them were rubbish. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, you know, you just have to keep going. It's so hard for a fan of a band to think about what it would be like for those songs to be rubbish. I can't imagine what it would be like <laughs> to hear a rubbish Radiohead song, especially if I know that those songs, I already like them, I know they're good songs, right? So I can't imagine what a rubbish version of them would be like. Why, why, oh, why were they rubbish? Uh, have you ever seen that Stones documentary? Um, the, the, is it the Jean-Luc Godard one on Sympathy for the Devil? Oh, yeah. So they've spent three days recording it. Well, 
it's brilliant seeing that as a person band because day one and day two it's rubbish yeah you know it's not until they get the conga player in bill's playing bill's playing uh a cabasa or something uh -huh. and keith's on bass and then it gets to you know three days later and 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 i think that's i think that's the truth probably i think you probably find that with lots of bands i know that i've heard demos of bands for instance i think there were do you remember ages ago when you two did acting baby they leaked there were all this whole there, there was a whole leaked tape of them basically just jamming and most of it's rubbish and it's true most of it you know most of a lot of what you end up doing in the creative process is rubbish yeah and and the art is to not give in is to carry on persevere and and, and to be hard on yourself i suppose yeah and be and what the great thing with nigel is that he just he raises the bar so you know kind of he's you, hard man <laughs> yeah. i mean i've been at the uh, wrong end of nigel's taskmaster yeah, skills uh once or twice as well it's quite scary he drives you hard you think you've done the take you think you've done your overdub you think it's in there he says, maybe one more time <laughs> <laughs> he's the guy that told makaroff for not being good enough for goodness sake <laughs> you don't want to mess with him yeah well that's why he's so good he, yeah he, you know he, he he gets the best performances out of you he's amazing he's a because he also drives himself really hard as well mm. you know he's a real the quality of the stuff that he does is is really high so it's good you know it's it's good actually be, to be driven hard you know absolutely and uh so have you any idea when this album might see the light of day the current one no but i would love i would be, ideally be great if it came out sometime this year it's got to i mean i, I hope so and do you think you're weeks away or months away from completion? I mean, you, you can't say, I guess. I can't really say, but I mean, we're, we're, it's, it's, it's the finishing line is, you know, usually when you make a record, I'm sure it's like when you do anything, when you make a film, when you whatever, or read a, write a book, for, for ages and ages, it seems like the, the finishing line is, is miles away. And now it feels it's, it's in touching distance. But of course, it being the creative process, this, this last bit also, you know, you have it's like anything you have bursts of energy and you, but you achieve you know a lot in a certain small period of time and then sometimes things slow down and you just there you're nearly there you're nearly there and you know you get there so yeah hopefully it's going to be a matter of weeks excellent let's listen to some of the music that you've brought in right now and uh this is a track from dio dato i don't know anything about this band all i know about them is that they provided the opening titles for being there the peter sellers movie yeah i mean that's where that's where i first heard this track yeah and that 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 bit when chancy i'm mean, being there is one of my all-time favorite films it's an amazing film isn't it and when he leaves the house into the big wild world chancy garden and he's walking down he's walking in washington dc lost and and the music this music comes on and uh, i don't know anything i mean diodato he was brazilian i think okay and uh, there was in the band he had like a young uh, i think that the, there's a young funky guitarist who's a bit of a prodigy kid and then they had stanley clark the the the, the ubermeister funkmeister on bass and um well we can hear it bubbling away underneath us and uh, we won't play the whole thing because it's yeah. a bit of an epic but uh here's a nice Diodato there with Also Sprach Zarathustra by Richard Strauss. How are you doing, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome. We are uh, flailing in space. This is Adam Buxton here. This is my big mixtape, 2010, A Tape Odyssey. And my guest is Ed O'Brien from Radiohead. Hello. Again. He's the tall, handsome one uh, who plays the guitar and uh, he has many pedals on stage. Is that fair? L lots of pedals. You love your pedals. I love pedals, man. Absolutely love pedals. I've got more as well. Yeah. Listen, before we get into that, um, <clears throat> on the 2001 tip mm -hmm. there, as we were, have you ever heard the Portsmouth Symphonia's version of that track? <laughs> no. Do you know about the Portsmouth Symphonia? Nothing. Um, well, this was something that Brian Eno was involved with, one of the many uh, enjoyable, perverse art projects that he's undertaken in his life. And this was around 1970 at the Portsmouth School of Art. And the idea was that it was an orchestra comprised of uh, non-musicians. Uh, and if they were musicians, you had to play... Uh, an instrument that was entirely new to you okay mm -hmm. so it was a kind of a, a completely naive orchestra if you will um and you can imagine that the the noise they created was quite bizarre and the project was it had to be done they had to play as well as they possibly could they couldn't do like jokey playing in fact brian Eno said uh, at one point they had one guy who came in and he thought it was a big joke and he was sort of making funny honking noises and they had to boot him out because he wasn't taking the thing seriously but this is what they sounded like doing uh 2001 there the also sprach zarathustra <laughs> Ha <laughs> 
<laughs> the symphony's good. <laughs> the bagpipes on the wave. Here we go. <laughs> There's no way they were ever going to get that one. <laughs> no. but this is the thing: is that um, it's particularly effective with the brass instruments because yeah. they're so hard to play. So hard. I played the trumpet for four years. Did you? Yeah, and I was rubbish at it for four years. It's really hard. Wow. It's not like picking up a guitar where you can strum a chord. You can make it sound it. decent in a day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 Whoa! What are they gonna do now? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you gotta love Brian. Brilliant, man. good man. Um, well you of course uh, worked with Dino. Uh, you spent a day in the studio. Did he not sort of oversee the creation of uh, either Lucky or the Tourist no, uh, for the War Child album? No. He wasn't. We've never worked with him. Uh, Have you he, not? No. We sent... A, we sent... Or, or were you... What was the deal <coughs> with the War Child album? Was that something that he kind he, of roped you into? Yeah. He, um... He, uh... He was... Isn't he the patron of War Child? Oh, yeah. And he started it up and it was... It was a brilliant idea. It was actually a... One of those great moments when you look back on it, that whole thing of everybody doing a track in a day, and it was really exciting. Yeah. Brian Eno, actually, when we were making OK Computer, here's a bit of trivia. Mm -hmm. We had a track, there's a track on the album called Let Down. Sure. And um, we'd finished it quite early on, and we sent it off for him to be, to, for him to mix it. And, um, yeah. And what did he come back with? Uh, he just sort of tried out that you you were sort yeah. of thinking we, we, let's see what brian Eno comes up with well i think the thing was because it was nigel's first first big out al first album and i think he was kind of quite up for someone else maybe he you know i think my, nigel i don't know why but maybe it was deemed it was the it was the fashion in those days that sometimes you get someone in to mix it you know the bends and Pablo Honey, the bends had been recorded and produced by John Leckie, but mixed by Slade and Calderi. Right. So there was, a tre there was a trend for people to mix stuff. And, um, and I, I thought, I remember thinking that we thought that the track was appropriate to maybe Eno's kind of, kind of, it was, it was a big sort of, uh, it was a big, beautiful kind of stellar track and mm. that it might suit him. And, um, and, you know, it's very difficult to mix something that you have no idea of what the band want. Because the final it. mix on the album is not his. No, it? Nigel mixed the whole lot. And, yeah. and I mean, Nigel's, you know, he's uber mixer. He's amazing. He is a massive doo-wop fan, though, Eno, isn't he? He is a big doo-wop fan. And so did he try any of his <laughs> doo-wop backing vocals on there? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, he hasn't. But there are apparently many stories of Brian Eno doing sessions and sort of coming in and... and uh, and adding some doo-wop vocals to some fairly unlikely tunes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, I always like a bit of Eno doo-wop, you know. He's a big fan of backing vocals, obviously. Yeah. He believes strongly that a great song always has a sort of harmony backing vocal that you can sing along with. Yeah. And that's that's the enjoyable thing for the listener. I find that all the time, that I like to take the high harmony parts yeah. in the car. You're like my mum. Right. Yeah. And that's your job in Radiohead when yeah. you're playing live, of course. Yeah is to do those high harmonies yes and so when you're in the car do you find yourself carrying on uh you know when you're not yeah. at work I, like, I mean it's kind of <laughs> yeah you know I, I guess it's the i think the backing vocals things are great i mean I, it, for me it's always i mean if i'm honest up until recently i always found them pretty tricky because tom had usually sung them in the studio so he's got a much higher range than i have and he's also got a much better voice than i have so i remember you know uh sort of uh, okay computer era sort of going on stage and doing backing vocals and kind of you know trying not to not really going for it because i was very self-conscious that i wasn't actually doing the job properly because the first time i ever <clears throat> saw you play i was really struck by how similar your voices sounded and when you, i guess no surprises is the one where it's a very very distinctive yeah. harmony line that comes in at the end there yeah and uh, I was knocked out. I was like, wow, he can really sing. Oh, really? Well, and, uh, and, and, and it sounded, I always sort of assumed that it was Tom doing both vocal parts on the album. Would it yeah, be Tom he does. Doing I both? mean, I, you know, I've done very little vocal parts in the, on the, on the uh, recording because it's just, I guess it's a confidence thing. I mean, Tom's got such an amazing voice that he can go in and he just gets those backing vocals out. And yeah. I'm, 
you know, you might ha you might be an hour later there with me, kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm there nearly. <laughs> but live, it sounds just amazing. Well, I love it. I mean, I love singing. I mean, basically, I really love singing. And, mm. and you know, you know, once you get to once you get the confidence and you love something, then it becomes a lot easier. You relax. You get the notes. You know. Man, I want to talk to you about the whole business of playing live and, yeah. and touring in just a second. But let's have some more music now. This is another track that you've brought in with you, Ed. Uh, tell us about this one. This track is uh, Into the Sun by Diplo and Martina Topley Bird. And uh, in fact, the first time I heard this was on the tour bus about three years ago, and Tom played this track. I know Martina Topley Bird. I, d I don't know Diplo. Do you know that track, Pond de Floor? Oh, sure. Yeah. Major Lazer. Major Lazer. He's one half of Major Lazer. Is he? Yeah, he's very talented. He used to go out with Mia. He basically programmed uh, and kind of, I think he did a lot of the music on Paper Planes. Okay. And uh, he's he's a whiz. He's brilliant. And Martina Topley Bird is obviously brilliant. I mean, she was she was she sang on the on the, on Max Inquay, didn't she? She was Tricky's muse. Ah, she's for a while, amazing, wasn't she? and yeah. her voice is just you know. That was Into the Sun by Diplo featuring Martina Topley Bird. Hey, how you doing, listeners? This is Adam Buxton here. Thanks for listening to my big mixtape this afternoon. My guest is Ed O'Brien from Radiohead. How you doing, Ed? I'm good, man. Very nice to see you. And we were talking before about the whole business of uh, singing and playing live and stuff like that. I mean, how long have you been at it now? We, well, we've been a band since uh, 1985. 1985 that yeah. was a long time ago. that was a long time the, the <laughs> summer of live aid good one yes and when you formed then you were called on a friday on a friday yeah. and what, what at some point you were called something like whirly gig or something <laughs> do you want a full rundown yeah come on then <laughs> okay try not to laugh too hard then we became dearest dearest <laughs> whose idea was that i think that was uh i i shouldn't i i shouldn't attribute the blame i think maybe yeah. that was tom something then <laughs> There was shindig. Shindig? <laughs> what the hell was that? Were you going through like a pogues phase or something? I think, I think one of the things is we were sort of quite, there was a kind of, sorry, there was a bit of an Irish phase going on. <laughs> Phil, had a, Phil had an Irish girlfriend at the time. <laughs> That's enough, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And uh, we it was sort of there was a kind of and there was that's right there was another the worst one was a name called uh, Wise Up. Wise Up, I've never yeah. heard Wise Up. Wise Up was a kind of because a, a, a Wise Up is isn't like a, a Northern Irish kind of phrase. Why why didn't you Wise Up? But of course it was at the same time as Happy Mondays and was a bit like flowered up. Okay, so it was kind of quite clever, really. It's more like um, some kind of Janet Street Porter youth show. <laughs> Come on, wise up. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of rapping in the middle. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Sunday morning. Yeah. And um, Shindig is my favourite. Shindig. Terrible. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Shindig. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, as well, stylistic, stylistically at that time, we were all over the shop. I mean, you know, we were literally, we were playing the music that we loved and we loved everything. So there was yeah. a track that sounded, we did a, you know, we had a track that sounded like... Um, Elvis Costello, there'd be a track, there'd be the, there'd be the homage to the Smiths, there was a, there was a Steve Earl, do you remember Steve Earl Copperhead Road? Uh-huh, sure. For one summer, Phil, um, Phil went away to Northern Ireland to be, you know, to be with his girlfriend, so we got another friend in to play, and Nigel's a bit more of a rock drummer. Yeah. And uh, he, he kind of like fall on the floors and, you know, stick twiddling kind of thing, and it was, it was suddenly we were like, we were sort of like country rock. Yeah. So, it's, you know, you, you kind of have to go down all those different avenues or country lanes in yeah. our case. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. one, of the, one of the impressive and heartening things about Radiohead is that it, apparently by sheer dint of hard work and tenacity and, you know, perspicaciousness, whatever the right word is, you have turned yourselves into a good band from fairly inauspicious beginnings, if you don't mind me saying so. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Would you say that's fair? Yeah, I mean... <sighs> I, 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 okay, so when we first started, I thought well, that we were the best band in the world. I yeah. mean, I remember there was this feeling that when we first, you know, 1985, uh, you know, probably about third rehearsal, there was a feeling that I, I remember thinking, God, this is amazing. Um, then, of course, you know, six years later, you get your record deal, you sign, and you make a record, and you still think you're really good, and then you make a record, and it's not great, you yeah. know, and... and and we hadn't got we hadn't got our chops together you know for instance when we were signed it was it was the sort of nirvana you know post stone roses and and people were saying you know people would say i remember one record company said so uh what's your what's your agenda what's your manifesto 
and we're like uh, music and so we sort of stumbled you know the first and our, our, i think collected uh, image wise we looked terrible you know we didn't think these things were important and i guess they're fairly naive and of course they're important you know how you look and how you present yourself so we were fairly shambolic in the early days and i think it was by the by the whole experience of 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 pablo honey and then creep getting really big and in america and you know finding yourself in the public eye looking shambolic and we we knew we had to we had to get our stuff together you know and um and so who do we look towards i mean the coolest band at the time and they're still very cool were massive attack as far as we were concerned it's like okay we need to re reappraise things and it wasn't a very conscious thing but we knew we had to do it differently so it was kind of like i think the big thing was doing the videos first it was getting on the bends it was getting jake scott in to do fake plastic trees and um and street spirit and it was just at that time the the, the video could really define you as yeah. well and so that that really helped yeah because uh i know i remember being sort of aware of radiohead and aware of pablo honey i remember very clearly um seeing those posters with the baby there and yeah. thinking what the hell is that yeah and uh and then a friend of mine louis theroux in fact who was a guest on this show sort of said uh, are you into radiohead i was like not really and he said oh you should check out this album the bends that's come out it's good and i was like really is it yeah. and he gave me a tape of it and i just didn't listen to it for ages and then i was on holiday in france and it was kind of a grim holiday me it's just me and my dad wandering around <laughs> I don't know what we were doing and on one long drive i thought oh i'm just gonna listen to this thing that louis given me and instantly planet telex comes on and you think oh okay this is yeah. quite different and uh this is good this is what they call widescreen music yeah. on press releases and i thought and you know track after track you think hey this is uh I don't know what, which part of me this is speaking to, but it's speaking very loudly to it. Well, we knew after Pablo Honey. I remember my, my dad is always a great arbiter today. He says, he said, one good song on Pablo Honey. I said, what's that? It's creep. Rest is, you know. And it's, that's maybe a little harsh. But um, basically, when we, when we were doing the bends, we knew that, we, that the idea was that 12 songs, everyone, every song had to be a kind of a single. Yeah. It had to be in that. We had to because we were losing momentum. And we were losing momentum fast and sort of creep held us in there but you know bands when you're when you're young it's inertia momentum it's if you feel you're like if you're going down you've almost and everyone can sniff it anyone can and they want it they want to see they wanted to see us fail you know we were five minor public school boys from oxfordshire you know they didn't we weren't liked by the melody maker enemy i mean the reviews were terrible and they were probably justified but they really didn't like anything about us yeah except the list you know except people like creep and that kept us in there and so it's like okay we've got kind of like one chance and that was our chance on the record and and lecky was brilliant and that's when we met nigel because he was the engineer on that session so um so all started coming together <coughs> yeah and was that but was that a fun time was that a hopeful time or were you ground <laughs> down by it did you did you just think listen maybe we shouldn't be doing this not really it wasn't fun i mean it was the thing that was always there was when we were touring Pablo Honey with these songs that Tom had written, Tom and, and uh, we knew that they were really special, you know, because we were playing a lot of them live. You, you know, we must have been mid-twenties, so you know you want to do things a certain way, you know you want to do this, but you're, you're, you don't have the confidence to see it through. So, for instance, when he first went into the studio, and it was the last time the record company really told us what to do, EMI, they said, we want you to record these five songs up front and we think they're potential singles. And so there was Just and there was Sulk and, and it was disastrous because it put all this pressure on us to get it right at the beginning. And it's like, you don't enter a recording session like that. You enter into it like you just do it. You know, the thing pans, it's, it pans out, you know, it evolves naturally. So, um, but we, did, we weren't in a position to say, no, we're not going to do that. So it was, it, was, it was a bit fraught. And what happened was that we had about six, seven weeks in the studio in london and then and we sort of abort we didn't abort the sessions but we we thought right what we need to do is go out on the road reconvene and basically went out on the road and played all these songs live came back in and did them live in most of them live in about three weeks at, at the manor studios outside oxford and it was you know it's just uh, uh very very lucky but we i guess we just kept on doing we kept on going and that was the key yeah keep your head down yeah we're going to skip ahead musically right now to okay computer one of the b-sides that came out i think for karma police yeah and that was an album that um you know obviously 
meant a lot to a huge amount of people, continues to mean a lot to an awful lot of people. That's when I met my wife that year, 97, and uh, it was really intense. There was so much good music mm. around, and then that album came out, and, I, and every one of those tracks spoke to me. And then there was this instrumental um, on the Karma Police single, and I just thought, wow, this is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. I found out since that you're responsible for it. It was Meeting in the Isle. Um, and am I right in saying that's the only instrumental that Radiohead have ever done? Yeah, I think it's the only instrumental. I mean, I'm I'm only I'm responsible for coming up for the original riff and the music, but you know, I wasn't responsible for the production of the track, Nigel. Right. And in fact, Nigel, you know, we all we all worked on that. But yeah, I think that came out of uh, St Catherine's Court, where we Jane Seymour's. Oh house, yes, when Le we were doing OK Le Computer, Jane Seymour. And late at night, f fooling around with my pedals as you and then came out with this riff and then we sampled it and Sam and Henry who are basically zero seven mm. they did the drum programming on that so um and it was it I like this track because it reminds me of that it's it conveys that feeling of what it was like around that time there's a there's a there's a whole element of just you're kind of almost like in a trance you're just doing this stuff you're you're going in this bubble through the world an okay computer was amazing but it was like this thing was we were sort of the same in the, the eye in the storm and this thing was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it was a magic time don't get me wrong and for me this always sums up that time of kind of just uh what's the word um progression uh movement and and sort of being quite spaced out naturally this is meeting in the aisle that's meeting people in the aisle from Radiohead there, and my guest is Ed O'Brien from the band. Let me take you back yeah. uh, to that time, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm thinking of the documentary Meeting People is Easy, yeah. directed by Grant G. And that is basically painting a picture of the band around the OK Computer touring time. Mm -hmm. um, and you look as if you're under a lot of pressure, both sort of external pressure from uh, critics and things becoming successful, and also sort of internal pressure about how to actually deal with that. Do you think when you see that film, and uh, I don't know if you've seen it since, do you think it was sort of exaggerated, that feeling of claustrophobia and imminent implosion? Or was that a fairly accurate portrait? It was very accurate when Grant was out with us. Right. And he happened to, I mean, I don't know what it was, but he happened to be around the moments when it all got a little hairy. I mean, there were lighter moments. You know, the Japanese stuff is was followed by an, a glorious tour of Australia. Um, but it was, you know, I just think it was one of those things. It was just growing pains. I mean, I think it, we, 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 we wanted to be in that situation, but I just, we weren't very good at handling it. We were basically collectively quite shy. Individually, we were quite shy. Um, and it was, uh, you know, we just weren't very well prepared for it, but, but it was all good. And then sort of because i remember thinking like oh no you know this band is not going to last they're just yeah. going to fold yeah because the lead singer is uh you know he's he's writing these songs from his heart mm. suddenly he's got all these fans out there who feel like he's communicating directly with them there's all that unbelievable pressure from you know a, a group of unusually emotional and intelligent fans i would characterize radiohead fans as being you know myself included <laughs> of course okay um, but that must be that must continue to be a huge pressure for all the members of the band, or is it not? Not really. I mean, I, it was a pressure on Tom around that time, and I think, I think you know. Hence, you see the shift to Kid A, and and you get withdrawing get, a little. Withdrawing, bit. that's right. And and I mean, I think what's interesting about um, in Rainbows, I remember at the time, and I think it was sort of brought on by Tom doing the Eraser. When Tom did the Eraser, the vocals were suddenly the first time in a long time first time since OK Computer, they were up front. And that was a big thing on In Rainbow. Suddenly, there was something very tangible to hold on to. And I think what happened was that Tom, it, you know, it's a, it was a, it was a, you know, security thing. It was, it was to remain intact. He, he, he withdrew. And Kid A is like it is because it's, it's, because it was, it's a reaction from what went on before. And I, I think precisely as you said, it doesn't sit comfortably. Suddenly people are latching onto every single word you're, your your writing and, mm. and and taking them to heart and personalizing them and and you know that's a that's a that's a strong you know that's a strong load to bear it's isn't a it? lot of responsibility yeah and the 
flip side of that of course is that when you're so visible and so successful you get a lot of people saying come on they're not that good yeah and why don't they stop whining and yeah, yeah. you know what's so wrong with being successful if you don't like it stop doing it yeah um uh, were there bits of criticism that that remain with you to this day uh, uh, things that either fans or critics said about the band that you thought oh that hurts <laughs> not really i mean the only thing <laughs> The only thing that comes into my mind was <laughs> my really good friend of mine, Raj, he said, listen, mate, you've got to check out this web website. And I never, I mean, I never, ever, I don't read our reviews. I stopped reading them around the time of Kid A. Any, I don't see our stuff. I don't listen to us, you know, because it makes you too self-conscious. Yeah. And he directed me, the only bit of criticism, he said, he directed me to this website. <laughs> and it was about how I was the worst dressed member of Radiohead. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at it and was like, yeah, they're right, aren't they? They're really right. Around about when was this? Oh, this is about 2003. Okay. So, I mean, it's very superficial. I mean, you know, people say we whine. Well, you know, I mean, ugh, you know, life isn't necessarily better roses wherever you are. And, and I think that in those days, we were, you know, we were struggling with a lot of things. We were struggling with, 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 with ourselves and, you know, so it's, it's well, fine. Struggling with universal things. Exactly. That's why people latch on to the music and that's why it means so much to them. It's totally. That's, and, and we've always been honest. I mean, Nigel said to us in the early days, God, you guys are like method actors. It's like we, we would have to get into the right collective mind space and, and it would come out. But it wasn't a conscious thing. It's not putting it on. It was as we were. And I... You know, I think we've, we, we were sort of very lucky. And I think it still is true to that. You have, the only way you can make music is to be honest about... The only way mu music is good is if it honestly reflects where you are as an individual and as a collective. And, and that's always been the case. And it, it has to carry on being the case. Otherwise, you get into dreadful kind of scenarios where you're second-guessing what people want and you should be like this. It's like, it just comes out. Absolutely. Um, man, just before we play a bit more music, uh, you mentioning being called badly dressed there oh, by yeah. someone. <laughs> really badly. I mean, that's harsh. I think of you as being very sartorially correct on stage these days. Well, I made an effort in the last four Did years. <laughs> yeah. Ever since reading that. <laughs> yeah, man, it was terrible. <laughs> and they were right. They had these pictures and it was like, they, they were like, captions is like, what are those trousers? And they were, what, what the hell <laughs> what, was going what, what on? What were you wearing, like salmon pink cords or something? No, they were like, they just, they were ill-fitting. Because I'm quite tall, I, um, I would get kind of things that didn't quite fit, so maybe they were a little bit short, you know. <laughs> Mr. B. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then, are there, are, there, are there times when, you know, you're all in your dressing rooms or whatever before a gig and then everyone convenes for whatever the Radiohead <laughs> version of the band Hug is before you go on yeah. stage? And you look at what someone else is wearing, and you think, wah, wah. <laughs> "Do we have to, do we mention it?" Or in the early days, certainly. Oh, really? I mean, yeah. I mean, we don't have individual dress rooms. We still have us. But in the in, in, now, it's kind of it's funny. You kind of the the more time you hang out with people, the more you sort of morph into looking the same. We've been saying that recently. But um, it's certainly in the early days, there were, there was a waistcoat. That there, was, there was a waistcoat that Colin used to wear that was, you know, it was a, he'll kill me for mentioning it, but, um, uh, yeah, and there were, I mean, everyone would look at me constantly and I knew there'd be a sort of raised eyebrow. It's kind of like, those trousers are two inches too short, <laughs> <laughs> but we're not going to tell him. <laughs> Isn't that was called Hawaii in 10 seconds. Before that, you heard Plone from 19 there from Scott Four. I think we've played almost every track from Scott Four at some point on uh, the big mixtape. That's what you're listening to, incidentally. Hey, I'm Adam Buxton. Thank you so much for tuning in, listeners. This week, our fictional compilation is a space-themed tape. Uh, it's called 2010, A Tape Odyssey. And my guest, who chose that last track, incidentally, is Ed O'Brien from Radiohead. How are you doing, Ed? Very well, thank you. Uh, I've got some questions from some of the people who've been blogging um, and uh, logging into the blog, doing some blog logs. And we were overwhelmed with questions, let me say, um, when people found out that you were going to be on the show. So apologies to anyone out there who doesn't have their question read out. Here's one from James. He says... Ed, after seeing many of your concerts, I noticed that unlike Johnny, Tom and Colin, you seem to use a wide range of guitars. I see Strats, Tellys, Gibsons and The Plank flying on and off stage. Which one is your favourite or do you not get attached to your guitars in that way? What's The Plank? The Plank is, uh, it's, it was built by Peter Plank, uh, our sort of chief backline. Pete's been with us, Plank's been with us forever since like 93. He looks after, he's in the studio with us, looks after all our gear. And he built me a, a guitar in 90, 
three. Then we had all our gear nicked in 95 when we were on tour in America and he built another one. So it's a, it was, it's a very beautiful kind of, it's a kind of a Rickenbacker Gibson hybrid that he built. And um, yeah, it's lovely. And do you have favorites? Yeah. Yeah. I've got, I just, I, he's right. I, I play way too many guitars on stage and I'm stripping it down. Next time we go out, two guitars, Gibson 335 and a Fender Tele. That's what I'm going to use. And a lot of pedals. Lots of pedals. No, I'm stripping. I'm actually, Are you? yeah, man, but I've got it down to an art now. I've really, I've been, I've been working on it. Which one would you keep? Which is the ultimate pedal? The ultimate pedal. Well, I've just got this one called the Clon Centaur. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I am the Clon Centaur. What is your bidding? It's brilliant because it's like, it's, 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 a, it's a boutique pedal, you know. Step on my face, I will change the sound. <laughs> but it's got, like, it's got a centaur on the pedal. Does it? <laughs> yeah. They have little horns coming out. Yeah, totally, man. <laughs> it's just a bit disconcerting looking down there and there's a centaur. What about the Chaos Pad? Is that still Chaos coming pads, with you? Johnny uses the chaos pad that's still around that's yeah still there yeah that's still there that's still rocking yeah. our world excellent thank you very much for your question there james let's play another track right now that you've brought in for our yeah. space tape Ed. yeah what have you got for us well i've got runaways by xtc which is uh it might seem a little tenuous link but i thought we'd be running away into space you sure. know and xtc are banned well i mean that's the first track off english settlement great album i think black probably black sea is my favorite album by xtc mm -hmm. But they were a Swindon band as well. So they're kind of, I lived halfway between Oxford and Swindon. And um, there was this bizarre rivalry between Oxford and Swindon that <laughs> used to exist and uh, used to manifest itself in, in, in the football games mainly. And uh, I was sort of on the cusp of it. And you'd hear one on the one hand that the Oxford song about Swindon, I don't, I don't know if you ever heard it, it was like, we hate Swindon and we hate Swindon. We hate Swindon and we hate Swindon. We hate Swindon and we hate Swindon. We are the Swindon haters. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that coming from the, the, the east side of Oxfordshire. On the other side, it was more, we love Swindon, we, love, we are the Swindon lovers. And uh, I, I digressed, of course, but um, XCC, amazing band. And I love this, love this tune. And it's, it's, I think it's when they just sort of discovered the 12 string. And Fantastic. This is XTC with Runaways. <laughs> XTC with Runaways there. That was the choice of my guest this week, Ed O'Brien. Hey, this is Adam Buxton here, and you're listening to my big mixtape on Six Music. Thank you so much for doing so. And Andy Partridge, of course, is someone whose live commitments mm. uh, as a band have been curtailed by his uh, stage fright a lot of the time. I don't know if he's if that's something he's um, got over completely or not really. He's still sort of studio-bound mm -hmm. because of that. And that's a shame, I guess, for any musician because... Presumably, playing live is more than half the deal a lot of the time, isn't it? Well, it is isn't for that us. a fun part? Yeah, it is for us, but I guess it's horses for courses, you know. I mean, it's, it'd be really, it must be a nightmare for you if you, if you, you know, you feel that, you know, that you have to go out and play live and you've got such fear of it. I mean, I'm totally, you know, whatever he needs to do to make music is the thing. I mean, for us, it's a big part of what we do, so yeah. Is it something you look forward to, or do yeah. you feel frightened of it? Um, uh, a little bit apprehensive at the start of a tour uh in terms of just are we going to play well and then when you're doing it it's brilliant looking up at the stage and seeing you guys play and doing an amazing job it's so exciting and you just think and there are moments when like when you play there there particularly um it's uh it's the most exciting thing i've ever seen and you can tell the rest of the crowd to feel the same way mm. uh and it just lives up to all your fantasies about what it would be like to see this amazing band and is it like that on the stage though do you ever get that feeling like i'm in an amazing band <laughs> you get that feeling like this is an amazing night and the amazing night is it's not about us it's about everybody it's about the audience it's about us it's a real you know that's a, that's an amazing thing about music and that's the thing that i love about live that the you know when you come to one of our shows you're you're participating as much as we are in terms of it's you know if, if you want to if you want to get it down to you know physics it's an exchange of energy mm -hmm. there's energies going on there and so what happens is in a great night that what we do individually collectively and what the audience do it becomes greater than the sum of all its parts and i, I literally there are those nights when you think the roof is going to come off and we're all going to we're going to be sucked up into space and we're just going to it's it feels amazing yeah and it gets and i but i think you're tapping into those very primal things you know rhythm you know uh, uh tribal uh meditative um hypnotic 
melodic it's it, that's why we love music because it taps into something with all of us that resonates very very deeply so yeah i mean it's amazing i mean i feel like when you're in the middle of it it's 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 just yeah, and you're lost you're kind of lost in it it's just amazing yeah. and i mentioned they're there but are there tracks that you particularly enjoy playing and then you and you think oh i can't wait to play that one arpeggios on the last tour was like that was a real moment because it's just like because we it was one of those tracks that was always greeted phil started up the drums and it was always greeted with it <gasps> And you could feel it and it just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds and then it cuts down and there's this moment of kind of delicate beauty where we're all kind of and then suddenly it goes into the big, you know, it, it, for me, what, when I love music, it's really, really, it's, uh, there's a, there's a, there's, it's, I can see it, I can feel it, you know, it's, it's like a film. It's, uh, and, I, and it, it, it takes you places, it's very vivid. Mm. So, um. Yeah, Alpeggi is a good one for that. And conversely, is there a track that you think, oh, not this one? Again. <laughs> yeah, there must be, and I'm trying to wrap my brain. So Either because it's technically challenging or just because you're sick of it. There used to be, no, no, I mean, I think the technically challenging ones are good because they're the ones on tour as well. The, the ones that are really easy, I mean, we're lucky because we've got a big body of songs, so we never get sick. The songs we play, we're never sick of, but certainly in the early days, there was a B-side, it was on the Maya and Lung EP called um, Punch Drunk Love Song. Love, love punch drunk love songs love sick sing along and uh and it was it had so many chord changes and um we always used to joke that you know colin used to get used to fluff it or whatever some mm, the, like the bass is very unforgiving at least with the guitar you can sort of like move it or bend a note but the bass you kind of if you don't get the right root note you're like, oh yeah but we all used to make mistakes and that was a little kind of ten it was the early days when you played you had a you had a limited number of songs and you played you just played it um you play the same songs mm -hmm. and i have to i've mentioned calling it colin is the best bass player in the world so i feel like i'm just kind of like no we're all making mistakes on that but he'll know if he's listening he'll know exactly what i mean we used to laugh so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. what about when you finish a tour when you come off tour after all that yeah. uh, adrenaline is spent or at least it's still sort of yeah. coursing through your veins and exiting your body yes. that must be quite a period of adjustment when you come back home and you tricky. just have to deal with everyday life and nappies and yeah washing tricky up. I think it's, <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, Have you got better at making that adjustment now? Uh, I think you should ask my wife that, but probably not. <laughs> probably not. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, I, I, I've, I think what I'm going to do next time is stay away from home for about a week and just decompress okay. and maybe go to the woods and put a, string up a hammock and build, you know, because yeah. there is that, it's like Pavlov's dogs, you know, that that scenario nine o'clock in nine o'clock in the evening you're kind of like you're awake and your body clock's going and, and the worst thing that happens when for instance you finish a tour in america on the west coast so you're so you're going on stage at nine o'clock in america that's five o'clock in the morning in the uk so you fly back two days later every every morning for the next week i'm i'm bang five o'clock in the morning i wait i'm ready to play where's 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 the gig man <laughs> you know yeah. it's really really it's really hard and of course you know on tour it's quite a selfish existence because everything's geared to you doing the best performance that day and so you have people to help you have lovely food cooked for you you don't have to clean an ass you don't have to do anything you don't you know you just it's done for you, you don't have to do the nappies anything and um so when you get back it's a bit of a you know, shock yeah and also you walk back in expecting to be sort of like you know some the the, the returning hero and it's like just life has continued and you're just dad yeah. and you go but but we rocked twenty thousand people last night <laughs> brad pitt was at the show for <laughs> christ's sake <laughs> give me some respect <laughs> you make your own tea yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what it's like in the o'brien household <laughs> i can be a total ass when i get off tour you know and I, you got you got to recognize that as well <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear another track that you brought in for our space mix. Uh, now this is Mary Wells. I know. It's a How bit... is this space related? Well, the thing is, I was thinking. I was thinking about this. Like you're in space, and have you ever seen that documentary uh, in the Shadow of the Moon? Uh, I don't think so. It's an amazing documentary, and it's about. It basically is a documentary and interviews all the Apollo crews. Various and and there's, there's a similar one called For All Mankind that has Eno's music <coughs> on it. That's very good as well. Yeah, and it's, what's what's interesting is that when all the astronauts get into space. They always there's this there's this almost universal kind of um, experience that they they have, and it's a very spiritual one. And they always look back on the Earth and they see this beautiful blue planet, you know, that James Lovelock calls Gaia or whatever. This and it's like this the most beautiful thing, and they're aware of 
for the first time at how precious and how beautiful it is. And I thought, well, I, you know, given given that, what would be the what would be the bit of music if I was kind of like making it into a film? What would I do? And I'd be there with my own. I look back and I'd want Mary Wells, my guy, because there's something in that song of true beauty, true. It's it's very human as well, and it's it's full of love, and it's just a it's just a joyful song. And I think it would, you know, I I wouldn't necessarily want Richard Strauss to accompany me at that moment. I want something to warm my heart, and that song does does that. It's amazing. This is my Mary Wells with my guy. That was the final selection of my guest this week, Ed O'Brien from Radiohead. Thank you so much for coming in and joining me, Ed. It's been so nice to talk to you. Pleasure. Well, listeners, that's pretty much it though for our program today, and indeed for this.